it went from being like the most excited day, uh, you know, ever to like the biggest disappointment ever. So in high school, I always wanted a 300ZX, uh, but it obviously was way out of my budget being a high schooler working, you know, I worked for the IT department for the school district, but even then like way out of my budget. Those were still like 40 grand for a new one and 30 grand for a used one. Um, but like the forbidden fruit was the Skyline because they never came to America. And so that was the one I always wanted was the GTR. The GTR I got in September of 2014 and it was a January uh, 1990 car. So I knew I'd have a couple months to wait um, flew out to Japan November of that year, got to see the car, test drive it, you know, meet the guys that own the shop, uh, Zenitani in Osaka. Really cool experience. Um, and then the car finally showed up in like February of 2015. But at the time, I think it was like the second or third 25-year um, legal GTR in Colorado, which was pretty cool. Uh, so first one was GTR Garage. And they had, the, the owner was based out of Indianapolis. And they had an office in Oregon that they had just opened up at the time too. And they, they, you know, as part of the purchase of the car, you know, they would store it until January and then ship it. And then they would handle all of the ocean shipping and then the trucking out to here to my house in Colorado. You know, in hindsight, you know, I wish I had a little more control over that whole end to end process. But back in 2014, there weren't a lot of options. Um, most of the people that were importing cars were doing it themselves on the side, or they were like former military and they had some experience in how the process worked. Um, but there weren't a lot of like companies out there that were established. So there was a lot of like kind of fly by night guys just trying to do it on the side and it was kind of a crapshoot. So <laughs> it went from being like the most excited day, uh, you know, ever to like the biggest disappointment ever. So the car was supposed to be delivered in an enclosed trailer. This is February in Colorado. It's like snow and ice on the ground. Showed up on a flatbed on the bottom level too. So cars on top of it leaking some who knows what on it. But the big problem was it came over the mountains on a flatbed. The hood was open. The passenger window was broken open. Parts had been stolen off of it. The front end was smashed. And at a minimum, the head gasket was blown. So the problem was nobody in the row row did an inspection. Uh, the trucker also didn't do an inspection. They, the guy basically handed me a blank form and said, uh, sorry, no English, please sign. And I'm like, what? Dude, I have pictures of me driving this car in Japan in like perfectly fine shape. And like the bumper is like, the whole center section is like broken off and plasta welded back together as like poorly as possible. Like black duct tape and then plasta weld over, well, over it. And again, like the hood was open, like the headlights were stolen out of it. Um, it had a set of like xenon headlights in it. A bunch of the like the like oil cap and like other caps were just like gone. The wiring was all cut up. Couldn't even like turn the car over. We managed to jump start it with my truck to get it off the guy's trailer. And then I just like pulled it into my garage and I have this like picture of it just absolutely disgustingly filthy. And the problem was it wasn't even like not just the outside, but in the engine bay because the hood was open and on the inside because the window was broken open too. So, you know, it's definitely a huge letdown having that show up at my house in that shape. It came over with uh, an old uh, trust body kit on it. And when I took that off, I found the trust body kit was hiding a bunch of rust. So as part of like kind of the big rebuild that I had initiated at that point. Um, we actually cut the, uh, the side sills off the car. I, at the time I could get new metal from Nissan. So ordered a set of brand new side sills from Japan, got those in. Um, I think Danny did like five, six grand worth of metal work on that car alone, just in rust repair, the floor pan, the side sills, et cetera. But we stripped that car pretty much down to bare metal other than the front windshield and the rear windscreen didn't come out when they painted it. You know, the, the big one for me was to own one of every generation, the 32, the 33, the 34. And I never really f expected that I would have them all at the same time. You know, I thought maybe I'd upgrade from one to the next as they, you know, as time progressed. And then, um, you know, with the 
after I bought the 32 and I, I had the chance to uh, see what ours meeting was all about at Fuji Speedway, um, I really wanted to buy, you know, the next GTR I bought, you know, this is 1990 uh, to 95 for the 33. And for me, it was, you know, 2015 to 2020, you know, looking forward, like, okay, well, if I buy a 33 in advance and I work with a company that can keep it registered there, maybe I can have the experience of driving my car in Japan and driving it to ours meeting. And so that was kind of the goal from the, the get-go when I, I started looking at R33s was I wanted an established company that had offices on both sides that I could arrange that. Um, and that kind of comes back to Rivsu. So I bought a February 95, so an early model uh, R33, but it had all the Series 3 parts on it. So the, the lip, the headlights, the taillights, uh, the interior trim. Um, and it was a car that we had bought from Garage Yoshida. So a very well respected, you know, uh, restoration shop in Japan. So, you know, we, I told them, hey, you know, this, I really want to buy this car. Um, tell me what the price is. And by the way, I also would like to drive it in Japan. So if you can keep it registered for me, that'd be great. And, you know, at, at the outset, they were like, yeah, yeah, no problem, blah, blah, blah. We have a, our shop in Japan can hold on to it for you while we get all that arranged. And, uh, you know, another you know, week goes by and then I get the invoice and I, you know, transfer the money to them. And then, you know, another week goes by and I, I'm asking for updates and I'm not hearing anything. Um, and maybe a month goes by and I'm messaging, like sending messages to the U.S. guys and then the guy in Japan too, who had actually gone out to Garage Yoshida to inspect the car before they purchased it. And he sent me like 60 pictures, which was great. You know, and I ask him, hey, you know, what is the deal? Like I sent the money, did you get the money? And he, I get this kind of weird message where it's like, yeah, I guess so, it's paid for. And I'm like, okay, cool. Um, and then I, I kind of like just thought, all right, I got that all arranged, you know, I'll figure out like how to go visit Japan and then take it to ours meeting, you know, I'll start arranging that in a few months. And for now it's like coming up on the holidays, I'm not gonna worry about it. And then fast forward to like March, April of next year and I start seeing Facebook posts of people that are like, hey, uh, I just went to see Ribsu USA shop and it's like deserted. There's nobody there. There's nothing. Like the whole office is empty. And I'm like, oh, that sucks. Uh, so I start calling. The number's disconnected. Sending them emails, shooting them Facebook messages, no response, nothing. Completely dark. They just vanished. Someone in Florida decided to go see, I don't know how they had like the address of the owner's house, but they go there. The house had been foreclosed. I mean, they were just gone. So at that point, I filed a police report both in, here in Colorado where I had purchased the car and then also with the Seminole County Sheriff's Office down in Florida where the business transaction had taken place and they send you know, an officer out and they're like, yeah, the, the business is completely empty. The landlord says that they didn't pay their rent and their house has been foreclosed and they're not there. So there's nothing we can do. Uh, at the time, I started like, uh, th there had been a Facebook post by the Japan side where they, somebody had posted, you know, these concerns about Ribsu and the Japan side replied back and said, hey, everybody's cars are here, everything's fine, don't worry about it, blah, 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 it's all cool. And here's a picture of all the cars and they tagged a bunch of people on that post. And I reached out to every single one of them and I started this big Facebook chat group trying to figure out who all had cars stuck there and where they were at. You know, had they paid for their car? Um, who had they paid for their car? And when was it going to get shipped? And what, you know, come to find out, it seemed like they were just almost like pyramid scheming it, whereas each car became legal, they'd use the funds they had to send that one out. And like there were three of us at the end that got left holding the bag because they stopped paying the money and there were three cars that they said the U.S. still owed them money for. And, you know, at that point, you know, the police weren't going to help. And so, I, you know, the, the three of us hired a lawyer and uh, started like trying to figure out what had happened. There were a couple guys that had put deposits on cars that had just vanished. Like their deposit money was gone. Um, police actually did do something about that. Uh, they got their deposit money back. So we knew the Rivsu owners were still somewhere and still able to be contacted somehow. They just weren't replying to us. That first lawyer that the three of us hired actually turned out to be a crazy, 
party animal drug addict. And after wasting two years of our time and you know, like 9,000 of my dollars and 6,000 of another guy's and well, I, I'm not even sure how much the other guy had spent on him. Um, he literally had done nothing. He had drafted a letter and that was it. Two years. And this, this happened like during COVID. So we would keep hearing constantly like, oh yeah, you know, it's just all the courts are shut down so I can't do anything right now. And so it's just like, he, the guy was just like buying time and just blowing people's money. Well, t you know, two years into that, come to find out the guy has like 50 complaints filed against him. And I add my name to that list and file a complaint. Long process there, but that guy got disbarred and we all got about uh, $1,200 back. And that was it. And Florida Bar just said, yeah, too bad. And at that point I had three, four months left on my statute of limitations. And I, I actually went out and hired another lawyer. Um, I, I had a hunch where the owners were at um, because someone had spotted, the guy had a brand new R35, red R35 with custom Florida plates. Someone had spotted him in Fayetteville, North Carolina which is right by a military base. He's a former Marine. So I started doing like some skip tracing and like name lookups and stuff out there. You know, I'm an IT guy, so I can kind of figure out how to search for things. And I get a hit on uh, his wife's name, who was co-owner of the company. And, um, you know, with this new lawyer now hired and, you know, I have, I have a draft letter to go off of at least. Um, you know, we throw everything together as quick as possible and he sends a service officer out and sure enough, they, they find her at a house in North Carolina and serve her, which by default also serves him because she was half owner of the company. So, uh, we went to mediation and they agreed to pay me back uh, all my money for the car and for the lawyer. And they've been paying me back thousand bucks a month since. You know, after the whole ripsuit debacle, I, I didn't think I'd ever buy another JDM car again. Like I was kind of like, you know, this is, I'm done with this. Like, you know, screwed twice. I'm not gonna go through that pain again. But then, you know, I met you guys and your shop, you know, that used to be north of here and kind of got to know your process, which, you know, the difference between working with, with RevHard versus the other companies I'd experienced, which were very, you talk to them once, you send them some money, and then you just keep your fingers crossed for the next couple months and see what happens. Now that we've gone through this process, you know, five, six, seven times on some of these cars, um, when that R34 came up for sale and talking with James, and he's like, hey, you know, this one still has registration and insurance good through 2024. You could take this one to ours meeting if you come out uh, next year. And, you know, that was, that's a big selling point because that was one of my other goals was drive my own car to ours meeting in Japan. Um, so yeah, I'm excited that we're gonna make that happen this October.